said in your word that your word would not be returned void, Lord, that it would truly have its power, Lord, to fulfill everything you have promised us, O oh Lord. So we thank you for allowing us to experience that today, Lord. Let us truly be nurtured. Let us truly be empowered by your words this day in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the saints said, amen, amen and amen. I want to start off with a quick scripture, which is Isaiah 41.10. He says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. This is God's promise to us, folks. You don't need to worry because if he's for you, nothing could be against you. Folks, we started last week. Uh, with a two-part series. Today we're going to focus on Diffusing Anger, Part 2. Last week we based on Genesis Chapter 3, where we used the story of Adam and Eve and how their disobedience caused the consequences of fear, sin. And as we conclude today, we, last week we just basically just give you a little recap quickly of the first part uh, when we are afraid, uh, we're, we're going to be focusing on diffusing fears in relationships, in life, and in, you know, circumstances uh, that we face in our day-to-day. -day. Uh, last week, we focused when, when we're afraid of our faults. It makes us defensive and how we hide. And, and we lose in the story of, in the book of Genesis, in chapter uh, 3, uh, verse 10, he says, we, he, uh, he, uh, God calls uh, Adam and Eve because they hide after they have committed their sin, they disobey. Uh, God calls out uh, to Adam and Eve in verse 8. I'm going to start. He said, then, he, then man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Uh, amongst the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man. He says, where are you? And man answered. Uh, he says, I, I heard you in the garden, and, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Uh, ha have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Uh, and the man said, well, the woman you put in here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. We're always looking to blame someone for everything that goes on in our life. When fear hits us, we have a tendency to get defensive. We focused on that last week. Fear is the results of the sin of that disobedience. Feeling that frighten, feelings that frighten us is the next focus here. When I'm afraid of my feelings, I become distant. Now, I want to present this in a way that sort of can make it so practical to us how this happens to us and how fear usually causes us to, uh, matter of fact, it, it causes a lot of setbacks in our lives because God wants us to produce good fruit. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to enjoy life. But when we are afraid, it, dis it discourages us. It frightens us. The Bible says we are going to be, uh, if we're going to be an authentic person, we've got to learn how to express these particular feelings. Whether you're in a marriage, whether you're married or not, you've got to learn to deal with the feelings in life. And so often we don't know how to deal with these feelings in life. And there are three feelings that we're going to be focused on today. Which is, two, when we are afraid of our feelings, we become distant. God called Adam, why are you hiding? Adam answered, I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. Has he, he was never ever worried about being naked. Why now? See? Something happened. The perfect couple had all that they ever needed, and yet they blew it. 
Sometimes when we are drunk with fear, it could take years to recover. I heard a, read a story not too long ago of an individual because of his own junk and fear. He left home, left everything behind, and went and started a new family, started everything. 20 years later, he comes back and he just starts to sober up, realizing, what in the world did I do? Sometimes in life, we make decisions based on fear, and we just don't stop until, you know, who knows what happens. But they are, the Bible says that we are going to sort of face this reality. We have to sort of learn to deal with it. And there are three particular feelings we're going to talk about today. Hurt feelings, anger feelings, and sexual feelings. What? I always use anger first, but in this case, I'm going to use hurt feelings first. Why do hurt feelings scare people? We hate to admit when somebody hurts us. Who likes to admit when somebody hurts you? How does it make you feel to be able to admit someone's hurt you? Let's just be practical. Anyone here? Makes you feel weak? Unloved? Exposed? See, and these are the things we try to avoid. And when we try to avoid them, we make matters worse. Hurt will not destroy a relationship. Why don't you turn to someone? It says, hurt will not destroy a relationship. But resentment will. And what is resentment? That unresolved, not dealing with it, keeping it in, unverbalized hurt turns into resentment, folks. The Bible says that bitterness destroys relationships. We got to learn how to deal with it. Turn to someone. It says you got to learn how to deal with it. You can't avoid it. You can't expect the time to heal all wounds, as they say. Because if you don't deal with it, it's not going to heal the wounds. But I wonder why they say that. I guess they think that you'll forget about it. The Bible says bitterness destroys relationship. When it gets to that point, it starts to have an effect. we got to learn how to deal with it. Hiding the hurt intensifies it. Hidden hostility destroys more relationships than marriages uh, than most of anything else in marriage. But the question is, how do we deal with it? How do we learn to deal with hurt? And this is very important for us because we're going to face a lot of hurt in this world. There are a lot of things that are going to happen. We need to learn to speak about it. And that's one of the things most people don't like to do. They don't like to talk. They don't like to communicate what they feel for many reasons. But here, we have to sort of learn one concept. The Bible tells us that it's okay to be angry, but do not sin. That means it's okay to be angry because anger is a healthy emotion. But when we sin, we turn it into hurt. And hurt people hurt others. And that's how the cycle goes. So when we talk about anger, anger feelings... Why do angry, uh, angry feelings see, uh, scare people? Some people, especially Christians, often think I should never get angry. What Christians you think should never get angry? Any hands? Do you believe that it's okay to get angry? Yeah? How many of you believe you don't? It's not healthy to get angry. It's okay to be angry, folks. Some people, especially Christians, often think that you shouldn't get angry. So they hold in their anger. And that's not good or biblical. Sometimes we should get angry. Sometimes anger is a sign that you, uh, you care that the other person is damaging the relationship. Jesus got angry. He wasn't sinning, but he had to show that it is what you do with it. That really matters. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, be angry and don't sin. 
I'm going to tell you something right now you probably won't believe, statistically. You're not going to believe this because you may think, uh, well, before you, I make you speak for you, let me just tell you. Studies have shown that the healthiest re families, the healthiest families are those who fight occasionally and know how to solve the conflict. Did you get that? It's okay to be able to uh, get into conflict and, as long as you learn how to resolve it. How to make up, to forgive each other, and to, again, keep moving. If you don't talk your anger, or talk out your anger, you're going to, uh, again, cause more problems. Now, I'm just giving you some basic stuff before I get in because I wanted to give you the three steps. The hurt feelings, the anger feelings, and now we're going to talk about the sexual feelings. Why do sexual feelings scare people? Any thoughts? Not, not rhetorical. Why do you think even the word sexual may intimidate people? Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they did was, what was the first thing that they did? Do. I mean, in the Bible, it says the first thing they did. Yeah. You know, they covered themselves. You know, they were ashamed of their bodies. They were ashamed of themselves. The first thing that happened. Right? And so the Bible is very specific there. They said this is what they did, and then they hid because they felt something. So why do sexual feelings scare people? Sexual feelings are scared, uh, feelings scare a lot of people. After Adam and Eve sinned, and fear entered the relationship, the very first thing they did was, again, the reaction was they covered up their bodies. Fear makes us uh, self-conscious. That makes you self-conscious about your body. But why? Now, I'm going to tell you some stories, and we're going to talk about some things that, you know, so that, so that we don't have to be intimidated with this process. Their reaction was to cover themselves up. Physically, it said, I'm not transparent anymore. That's the key factor here. They were no longer at this point, uh, they had a little privacy in their own little world. Now they are exposed to everything. And we don't like to be exposed. Because when you are exposed, what do you leave yourself open to? That's right, that's one criticism. What else? Shame. What else? Rejection. Think about it. Once you expose, you are open to pretty much anything. We find that in our society today, we're always looking at someone's weaknesses so we can feel better about ourselves. And if you are insecure with yourself, then you are easy prey. But when you have someone like God watching your back, what do you have to worry about? Now, I want to I be really practical when we come to this because the first thing we, uh, I notice in a relationship, uh, and especially when you are in long-term relationships, you know, we are so many couples dissatisfied with sexual relationships. For many it is because they don't know how to talk about their relationship or communicate. Because they already, the society already teaches you to keep things in, close down, don't let everybody know, be private. When we are to do the opposite, we are to learn to communicate. They, know, they don't know how to bring up their needs or preferences or what they're feeling. God made us, God made us sexual beings. Turn to someone and say, it was his idea. He's telling us that he made us a certain way for a reason. And we have a problem with that. Not because God's idea was wrong. It's because of what we've been exposed to. And last, time, last week I spoke about so often when we are worried, you know, we uh, get tensed up. And I use the analogy that when we are in physical therapy and you're going through a certain therapy and they're working on a muscle that's hurt, that we're meant to breathe through that so that you don't tense up. But it's something so unnatural for us not to tense up because that's the first reaction we have. 
And God's saying, breathe. And breathing to us is about, about praying, about trusting him and not reacting. Is there going to be pain going to be there? Yes. How many of you have ever experienced pain? Okay. Right? Unpleasant. That doesn't necessarily have to stop you from accomplishing what you can do. Matter of fact, you can accomplish a lot more when you can do it that way. You don't even realize it, but there is more that God wants for us to accomplish. Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. And the key factor here is in love. But we look at love totally different the way God wants us to see love in the first place. See, God's idea is getting to you to understand, to trust him, to really know what he has planned for you. Turn to someone and says, God has a plan for you. Even though you don't think you have a plan, he has one for you. And it's not to fail. So he tells us to be strong and guard against spiritual dangers. The thing that's going to rob you of the truth. Be careful what robs you of the truth. Fear wants to rob you from the truth. And God's saying, listen, hold on. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. He says, do it my way. Trust me. Today, as we wait for the return of Christ, our Lord, Savior, we should all love, be kind, and, and be able to sort of hold on to this. But so often we're drunk with fear, we can't even see the truth. So much that a person who's drunk, you can't even rationalize with them. I said that last week. We start accusing people, we start doing everything a step, taking responsibility for what we need to do. And then we go to step three, which is we start to love. Now we go to demanding. When we are in fear, when, when, when we are afraid, we start to uh, lose, thinking that we are losing our freedom. And that becomes a major problem. Now think about it. Garden and Eden. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They have everything. They don't have to worry about clothes. They don't have to worry about nothing that's taking place. They got everything worked out for them. They are the perfect couple in the perfect environment with the best condo you could ever imagine. They don't ever have to do maintenance because it's all taken care of for them. They have nothing to do. They have one responsibility to name the animals. But they had it all. We're always looking for that, give me everything. I want to feel nothing. But here they are. Something still caused the problem. Now, here's the catch. When I'm afraid of losing my freedom, Before we go further, there is no real intimacy without honesty. Turn to someone. There's no real intimacy without honesty. We've got to learn how to deal with her feelings and anger feelings and sexual feelings in a right way. So I'm going to give you guys the antidote to that in a few. But when we are afraid of losing our, my freedom, I become demanding. We read the story in Book of Genesis, chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had everything. You think they were afraid of losing their freedom? Anybody? Not rhetorical? When things are going your way and everything looks great and wonderful, are you afraid of something? No? Of losing it, maybe? Because sometimes we wonder, when these things start to happen, you know, when, when people start to get defensive in relationships, when they start to feel, um, you know, discouraged, bored, it's all based on something that's being exposed here. I remember being in a really long-time relationship, and if you're in a relationship for more than 20 years, you get to know people. You know what their expressions in their face look like. You know what their, you know, you probably have the, you can finish their sentence before they finish it. That's how well you get to know each other. 
You become creatures of habit, so you, do, you identify to their feelings. But when something starts to go wrong, when you, they start to get defensive, you start noticing the little things. What kind of little things you start to notice? Think about this. When stuff, you, you're so used to someone or something, and it's going on for years, and all of a sudden fear gets in, creeps in there, you'll know that they'll become secretive. First thing you'll notice, they'll start to hide. You walk by, they shut down their laptop. When you, at one point you used to tell each other everything, all of a sudden there's all these things that you start to hold back from. You try to keep it. You don't want to let, almost like if I don't want to lose myself. You start to hide within yourself. You don't speak up. You want things you never wanted before. You start to start doing and looking for things that have, you have no business looking into. But it's there. The signs are there. It is easy. We become demanding. We want things our own way, so we hide everything. Your yearning shall be for your husband, yet he will lord over you. He will dominate you, in some scriptures say, losing your individuality. When you get married, when you're in a relationship, you're never meant to lose your individuality. Turn to someone. You're never meant to lose you. Most people go into marriage, they leave their friends, they, they just become one, and they think that that's all they need to be. Dangerous. Destructive. You're never meant to lose you. Why there are there a power struggle in marriages today? Why do you think there are power struggles in relationships today? Why do problems in relationship make us see the other person as the enemy? Fear. Fear. But how do you deal with that? Insecurity demands that I get my own way. Insecurity demands that I always get the last word. Insecurity demands that my rights be met. Security demands that I be in control of my relationship. Since that time, the struggle for domination in relationship began between man and woman. How? Why? If you go around insisting your rights in every relationship, you're going to be miserable, folks, and angry most of the time. You must learn to be happy in spite of the fact that not all your needs will be met. Turn to someone, not all your needs will be met. Be honest with yourself. Proverbs 20:27. 20, tells you the law gave us a conscience we cannot hide from ourselves. Be honest with God. John, 1 John 4.18 We have no need to fear someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread. Be honest with your mate in significant relationships. James 5.16, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you will be healed. Fully develop. Love experts every particle of fear. I mean, I'm sorry, it says fully develop. Love expels every particle of fear. For fear always contains some sort of torture of feelings of guilt. 1 John 4.18 Cause a shame whenever we have these guilt feelings. Psalm 32.7 says, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall, again, tells you clearly, surround me with songs of deliverance. But the one thing you got to remember, I'm going to read you a little poem. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems uphill, when the 
funds are low and the debts are high. And you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest. If you must, but never quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns around when he might have won if, if he struck it out. Stick it. He says, stick to your task. Though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with one more blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar, so stick to the fight when you are hardest hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. Turn to someone says, you mustn't quit. Stand your ground. James 1.12 tells us, Blessed is the man who endures trials. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The way to be in God's favor in his victory circle is by loving him and staying faithful even under, pres under pressure. But we have to choose to obey. Now let's talk about the story a minute. When Adam and Eve hid, they were faced with certain challenges. We're going to fall every so often. We're going to make mistakes. When we face fears, and what kind of fears do we face on a regular basis? Be a failure? Why? Right? If you're in a, playing in a team sport, and uh, I mean, how many plays team sports? Right? What are you afraid of? Is it losing? If you're in a job, what are you afraid of? Making mistakes. Right? If you're in a relationship, what are you afraid of? Right? The relationship not working out. Now let's be practical. In order for me to talk to you today about the antidotes that God has given us to, again, diffuse these fears, you need to be really practical about what you're facing in your reality today. You have to be really practical. You have to have something that you know that you can actually relate to because you can probably relate to Adam and Eve right now. But what did God give us today to help us overcome these particular fears? What has he given us? He's given us a promise because what, where they lost it at the garden, Jesus gave it back to us in resurrection. You see, what was once stolen based on disobedience, Jesus through obedience gave it to us. So we already recovered from that. But we're still living the lie. True or not true? So now we have to live in truth, not based on what we feel, because that's how the feelings get caught up in fog and we can't see truth. So we need something really practical. Obedience. Jesus had to learn obedience. Turn to someone and says, he had to learn obedience. What does it mean to learn obedience? Because you want to be really practical today about how to attain this, diffusing these fears and knowing, listen, Jesus took care of that for me. Now, it's coming. There, there's something called courage. How many, how many of you know that? What, what's the definition of courage? Doing something despite of what you feel. Right? If you want courage, how do you get it? See, you can't run away from fear. Our tendency is to run away from fear the same way we run away from pain. 
We're not meant to run away from those things, but those things have a purpose. Turn to someone and says, it has a purpose. So what is the purpose? You know, I, I remember because, you know, sometimes I, you, I grew up in an in a OK corral. I knew, you know, walking out those doors, you don't know what, what you can hit, get hit with in a moment. There was just so much going on. You can hear shooting at night. You can hear that. So when you're going to wake up in the morning and walk outside, you can see the back then they used to chalk up the streets. You know, when someone was killed in the street, they chalked it up. You, you see the chalk mark of the person that was killed in that spot. The blood stain still on it. So when we used to walk out of the building, you know, and you turn the corner and you can see those things, the, the chalking. And if there were several people killed, then you have a whole bunch of chalking all over the street. So you, you get exposed to that. You hear the gunshots at night. You hear the commotion. You hear come out in the street, see the chalking, the blood stain. You see all of that. So what happens? Yeah. You really don't want to walk outside, right? But you know what to expect when you're coming out that door, when you're about to hit the corner, the corner you're about to already, the image hits you. So growing up, there was a lot of that happening. Conditioning. God says, all right, you can hear the gunshots, but what can that mean? Someone's hurt, killed. Am I going to be afraid that that's going to happen to me when I walk out this door? Do I let that fear consume me at this point in time? Or do I say, oh, okay, Lord, you said that I shouldn't be afraid or worry about nothing. That means I'm bulletproof? So do I walk out there afraid? Or what can I do? Let's be practical. What can you actually do? And I, I just did something wrong. I could get fired for this. Should I just wait till the boss calls me in the office, worry every minute to see if he's going to call me to fire me? See? Fear causes you to want to hide. It causes you to not confront these things at all. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have taken that. Oh, but I took it. It wasn't mine. Should I be afraid that if I get caught, I'm going to tell my parents and my parents are going to beat me? You know, that was a fear. I was more afraid of my mom than anything else. There are things that we can easily get afraid of. But we have to learn to confront them. We have to learn to trust God, breathe through that pain, and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? The key is learning to be obedient. God, this is what you said to do. I'm going to follow your way. Now, some people may say, I don't know what to do in this circumstance. So, folks, pray. If you don't know how to pray, ask someone, we'll help you how to pray. But before you give in to that feeling, you're going to have to take truth. You're going to have to hold on to truth. And how do you get truth? Come on, folks, how do you get truth? Read the word of God, meditate, pray, fellowship. You call someone, but if you, you let you go hide, isolate yourself, distant yourself, then you're going to fall into the trap. Everything you've heard in the message is telling you, listen, if you, if you let fear take over, you're going to hide. Adam and Eve hide. They're going to don't want to expose. They want to keep everything in. They no longer want to talk to nobody. They just want to, you know, how can I, you know, not face. But your sin will find you out. Why? Because God wants you to be free. Not facing it is not going to help you. Worry is not going to add a day to your life. 
I'm not going to do anything good. He says, I got something special for you to do. Trust me. I used to tell my kids this all the time growing up. If you do something wrong, you better own up to it. Be honest. Do not lie. I tell them, don't lie. Deal with the, deal with the consequences. It's better to deal with the consequences and be free than to have that lie. And it's like worse than cancer. Because that, it doesn't just cripple you. It cripples the next generation. And the generation after that. And it gets worse every single time. God's giving you truth so that you can be free. Now, imagine you walk in the streets without any fear. What would that be like? Now, the slightest thing can cause us fear. We might not even be aware that the slightest thing can cause us fear. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, God gave us a picture of what happened with the disobedience. God tells us, maintain the truth. Focus on the word. Let's just do the things that are going to keep you strong spiritually. He gave us guidelines. Follow my instructions, and you won't have to worry about none of that stuff, ever. You'll face troubles and trials because they're going to come, but you don't have to worry because you have the victory. See? But these emotions that we get, it doesn't mean they're going to go away, folks. They don't go away. Now, I'm going to give you a quick scripture, and I'm going to have you guys work this out. See, I just want to see how well, how practical you can be with this particular scripture. I want you to see what you understand from it. And you want to, it's, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Okay, put it down. I'm going to have you guys discuss it in your line, with your table in your line. You're going to discuss this. You guys break it down in your own words. Tell me what you get from this. All right? It says this. It's a very short scripture verse, and it says... Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's what it says. Now, I want you guys to quickly, before we close, I want you to break it down and tell me what is it in your own words, what is it saying? It says, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Tell me what you could come up with. In your own words, what do you think it's saying to you? Got one minute, folks. Time is up. What do you guys got? What is it saying? You know, if you go to verse 4, it says love is patient, love is kind. It gives you a whole things of, you know, because love endures. Uh, again, when you think about God's love, it 
conquers all things. All things. It conquers everything you could imagine in life. The worst, love can conquer. Because love never fails. So when you read this scripture, what's taking place? What do, what do you take from it? That's right. It's reliable. And what does reliable mean? It's, it's, it never fails. You can depend on it because it, it will not fail you. Folks, God cannot fail you. We can make a lot of mistakes, but God, even in that, can turn it around and work it for good. But we are impatient. When God says love is patient, but we are impatient. And because we don't get the immediate results in that moment, we don't grow. We, we want everything yesterday. I can ask you, you want to be in shape? You want to do really good in your whatever you enjoy doing? Well, you need a little practice, right? A lot of times we don't want to do a little practice. Well, give me, give me a push-up. Oh, do I have to get out from a chair? That's, an, that's our attitude. That's our attitude. We don't, we don't want it. We don't want it hard. But God's saying, I need you to um, take yourself, pick yourself up in the chair. Understand. What else did you get from that? That's right. Can you imagine if you can be transparent like that? But if you're not transparent, what are you doing? You think you're getting stronger? You're not stronger, folks. Matter of fact, you're weakening. It's, it goes different from the way the world gives, you, gives it to you. It gives you one perspective to try to make you the one in charge to take control. And God's saying, I need you to just trust me. We need to say, take a step of faith. What else did you get? Anybody else? Yes. That's right. Never quit. Never stop. Keep moving. The problem is you set limits on yourself. Get that off the table. Don't set limits on yourself anymore. But that doesn't mean don't trust God. All right? That's very important. You don't have to put limits, but don't take God out of that focus. What do I mean by that? Think about this because this is important. So often God says, I don't want you to have limits. I want you to be able to go, soar. No fear, no worry, go. But... He says, keep your eyes on me. Don't lose sight of what I have for you because then pride can set in for you. And you don't want to set yourself up that way. But there is no limit to what you can accomplish. You may not feel because as soon as sin came in, it caused insecurity. And God, when Jesus took over, he gave you that security back in him. So you can do all things through who? Christ, who what? Strengthens you. He wants you to depend on what he's done for you so you can stay on course. So you went right back to the garden because you're still there with Jesus living, the Holy Spirit living in you. The spirit of truth lives in you so you have the garden all over again the same way Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the garden, the Spirit lives in you, walking with you every day, everywhere you go. If you're saved, that is. So here's the biggest question as we close. What did you learn today? It's not rhetorical. What did you learn today? 
Now I don't trust God. Anybody else? That's right. Anybody else? That's right. Love diffuses fear. What else? That's right. Yep. That's right. If you're not honest with yourself, you're going to be in trouble. Jade? That's right. I want you guys to bow your heads a minute. We're going we're gonna to address this in a different way today. People who live for God often wonder why they still face these temptations. And you got to remember that God does not the one who tempts us, folks. He doesn't tempt us. In order to refine our faith and to help us to grow in our dependence on Christ, he allows us to go through some of these things. But he's not the one that tempts us. We can resist the temptations to sin by turning to God for strength and choosing to obey his word. Focus. God tests his people, but he does not tempt them. Temptation is being seduced into sin, and that's not what God does. It's easy to blame others and make excuses for evil thoughts and uh, wrong actions. And I want you to take a na uh, mental focus on this because excuses include the, these things I'm going to give you now. It's the other person's fault. These are excuses. I couldn't help it. Everybody's doing it. It was just a mistake. Nobody's perfect. The devil made me do it. I was pressured into it. I didn't know it. I didn't know it was wrong. Oh, God is tempting me. A person who makes excuses is trying to shift the blame from himself or herself to someone else. Christians have to accept responsibility for his or her mistakes, for the wrongs, confess them, and ask God for forgiveness. That's what we need to do, folks. Now, I was going to tell you about the story of Moses and Pharaoh and the fear that happens and how we react to these things so often. But I need you to read that as in your own time when you go to Exodus chapter 5, verse 23. Or Exodus chapter 6, 12 to 13. Father, I pray today that as you know what we face every day. None of it's a surprise to you, Lord. You taught us what it means to diffuse these fears and it's to put our trust in you. We come before you today asking you to search our hearts, mind, spirit, so that we may learn what it means not to set limits on ourselves. You want us to live victoriously in this world you sent us to. So I pray today, Lord, for every member here. We pray that you give us the courage and the confidence to hold on to your truth. Because that truth that you have provided in 